I did bring it up both times. Maybe I wanted to see if he remembered. Why, though? I needed to change the subject in a hurry. So the Casey I know always had candy. You brand new now or what? Casey grinned. Look at you, thinking you still know me. Check it out, though. That ottoman right there in front of you, the top flips open. I flipped up the lid to the ottoman and almost cried at the sight. The hollowed-out space was full of candy, and not that new modern stuff. The candy we used to eat back in the day when we'd hang out. Red vines, Mike and Ike's, Juju's, and the like. TC must stock this up, too. She knows I like to lay here and watch movies and eat candy. Wistful and lost in nostalgia, I grabbed a package of red vines and ripped them open, then pulled out a long twist and bit off the end. I know, I said, my teeth blissfully stuck together. Me too. Casey turned on a movie, but we were ignoring it. I had made myself comfortable on the couch, kicked off my sandals, tucked my feet up under me and angled toward him. Casey had one leg tucked under him and one leg stretched out on the ottoman. Does your knee hurt? A little, he answered, rubbing it with his palm. Might be about to rain. Oh, you're one of those people now. Maybe my knee could get me a job at the local news station. Maybe you should run for weatherman. Clyde ain't been right about the weather in 20 years. So you're really not going to tell me about what's his name, huh? You're just going to keep changing the subject, thinking I forgot about it. I bit off another red vine and chewed. I was kind of hoping you would. Nope. What's his name? Dexter. Dexter, he repeated, adding a certain air to the name. Dexter sounds like a guy that wears suspenders and glasses and high water pants. So, Steve Urkel? Yeah. In my mind, he looks exactly like that. So was he? No, I answered, laughing hard. I'm not the kind of girl that would go for that. He was actually very cool for a finance and business major. Wait, hold up. I was a business major. I know. And I know you saw the upperclassmen in those majors. They all look like Urkel. I wouldn't have looked like Urkel. I would have been Urkel, he finished, referencing the nerdy Steve Urkel suave and debonair alter ego. I knew he was going to say that, so I was already laughing. So, anyway, Urkel, Dexter, what did he do? I don't mean for a living. I mean, how did he get sent to the pokey? Dexter, I began. Let's say he didn't start out that way, but it turned out that he was shady. Okay, let's say that. But then, let's say more. I didn't know the depth of his involvement. I tried not to know a lot. There was some kind of fraud scheme with their investment firm. He definitely turned a blind eye to it, profited from it. Everyone had finally stopped asking about what happened in Chicago. What happened to my job and my boyfriend and my relationship. Tamara knew because she flew up to Chicago to pack me up and drive me back. The last thing I wanted was my past flying around Potter Lake. Dexter's partner was running a fraud scam, taking money from certain investors and not investing it, but using it to pay off someone else, or pocketing it, or spending it, and then creating dummy records for money that wasn't even invested. How he thought he could get away with it, I don't know. Too smart for his own good, I guess. Well, he didn't get away with it, did he? Well, he's in prison, so no. Dexter took bonuses, knowing the firm wasn't performing at a rate that would merit that kind of payout above his salary. Then, the SEC showed up, asking questions. They told Dex he was culpable, and that he could go to prison for a long time if he didn't cooperate and testify against his partner. I was terrified, and I confided in Tamara. She got on the next flight, rolled into our apartment, started packing stuff into suitcases and boxes. She was like... What's that character that's like a tornado? Taz? Tasmanian Devil? Yeah, that. She came in on a Thursday. By Sunday, we had shipped most of my stuff back to Potter Lake, and she and I were in the car headed back there. She thought I could be implicated, and it was better that I left before things really got started. Some of the stuff Dexter bought me, I had to leave in the apartment. I didn't want to take anything that they could hunt me down and ask questions about. Wow. Have you ever heard from anyone? My mind rolled back to the day I opened the front door to find a man in a dark suit, wingtips and mirror shades standing on the front porch. My first thought, I remember, was, am I going to have to do Chapter hair nine. in prison? 
KC. So, you went to her house, man? Her house? Like, where she live? Kendrick sat in his barber chair, sipping on a cup of coffee. We didn't open for another half hour, but, like me, he liked to get in while the shop was quiet. Before the lines started forming, and the low murmur of voices and the buzz of clippers filled the air, I sat in the chair next to him, Eric's spot. I'd been talking to Kendrick and T.C. about getting after the guys to clean up better. Eric's spot was filthy, with hair gathered in the corners around his station and dried up drops of sanitation liquid all over the countertop. His combs were shoved in haphazard places. His mirrors were just sitting out. Our reputation was everything, and I didn't think we could afford anyone talking rough about how we didn't keep the place looking nice. Our conversation had meandered to Kendrick asking what had been keeping me so busy and so quiet. I'd been at home or at Rooster's Coffee Shop, working on what I wanted to say to the city council. I'd made visits to each of the owners of the businesses in the strip mall where guys and dolls rented space and then spread out to the shops down one side of the newly formed street and then up the other side. We had all heard the same party line from Mayor Adams, that there was money, incentives, tax breaks for bringing our dreams and our checkbooks to Potter Lake. Few had heard anything from the mayor since opening. A few of them, like me, had been running them down for their money. All were surprised, angry even to hear that there was actually no money. All were ready to join me at the city council meeting the following evening to confront the mayor on the issue. I told Kendrick about going out to see Leslie to ask for her help in getting the other side of Potter Lake involved in the protest. He lowered the cup of coffee he'd been drinking and stared at me as if I'd grown horns. I heard she was living back at home, so I stopped by. Miss Lee made me the most amazing meatloaf sandwich. Yo, wait, her mom made you a sandwich? Like you were at the house long enough to get a meal? She didn't kick you out? I wagged my head. Nah, she didn't invite me inside or anything. We sat on the porch and talked. Her mom came out to say hey. She remembered me from when Leslie and I were at Healy together. Kendrick and I had been friends since my sophomore year at Healy. He was my roommate, so he'd met Leslie, but didn't know her very well. Like me, he'd heard that she'd packed up and followed some guy to Chicago after graduation. That she was back here was as much news to him as it was to me. So what did Leslie have to say about the mayor? Did she defend his shady ass? No, the opposite. She's not a fan. I haven't heard from her, but I think I've got her on my side. Surprising, considering she hates you. Hates me? I waved Kendrick off, as if the very thought was ridiculous. She doesn't hate me. She's just still mad. She'll get over it. She hasn't yet. It's been damn near 15 years. I don't think she's been mad all those years. I think she's mad again, now that we've seen each other, had some words. And now that your shop being open means hers is in trouble, and yeah, there's that. I prop my elbows into the armrest of the chair clasped my hands, and rested my chin on my knuckles. I'm not sure what to expect tomorrow night. I think that's what's bothering me the most right now. You mean you might shoot your shot and then have to come back here and still have to deal with the mayor? Exactly. Well, Kendrick turned up his cup, downing the rest of his coffee, then tossed it into the garbage can next to the front desk. How serious are you about running against him? The next election is in October. That's not a lot of time. There's a lot of money and work, and what if you win? What about the shop? What about A? I held up a hand against the onslaught of questions, trying not to let the nervousness bubble up through my laughter. Are you trying to stress me into doing nothing? Let's handle one problem at a time. First, I need to know who's going to stand with me at that meeting tomorrow. I got to talk to Leslie and see if she's going to help me out. Yeah, good luck with that man. You're going to need it. I slid out of the chair and raised a fist to Kendrick. I bumped it and I turned toward my office. T.C. would be arriving in a few minutes to open the registers and begin the business day. I had a long list of things I needed to take care of around the shop, things I'd been neglecting in the past week, like burnt-out light bulbs and having the front windows cleaned, fixing one of the dryers on the doll side of the shop. My list kept me busy for a few hours. I took my time, watched traffic flow in and out, joked with a few customers, and even signed a couple of autographs. By early afternoon... I had wasted enough time and put it off long enough. I grabbed my keys and tipped out of the shop, throwing up a peace sign behind me. I'll be back. 
I told them as I walked out of the front door and stepped to the jet black Escalade I'd bought when I retired from basketball. I paid cash for it, because I wasn't sure how long the money I had saved would stretch, and the last thing I wanted was to have a vehicle repossessed. Who knew if I'd have to live in it someday? I pressed the unlock button and heard the alarm and the locks disengage. I climbed to the seat and started her up, and backed out of my reserved space in the strip mall parking lot. I was being dramatic, of course, about living in my truck. My parents had raised T.C. and me with a healthy respect for and a good understanding of money. That knowledge turned out to be useful. There were so many things I could spend my money on and so many more free things thrown at me, left and right. Everybody wanted me to be seen wearing their gear, their clothing, using their equipment, their electronics. In my prime, my endorsement deals were out of control. It felt funny at first, having a lot of money. Our family was comfortable, but never well off. Even with the rookie cap and paying an accountant and an agent, I was making more than I'd ever dreamt I could, doing something that I loved to do, certainly making more money than I would have made sitting in classes at Healy, being the star player on a college basketball team and trying to land a moderately paid summer internship. The chance to go pro just came at the right time. My mom had just been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, and the insurance policy Dad carried didn't cover the entire cost of recommended medication and treatments and doctor visits. I was desperate to find a way to help care for her. I never told Leslie about my mom. She was my best friend, somebody I knew I could confide in, but I didn't want to dump my problems on her. It wasn't up to her to solve them. When the answer came like manna from heaven, I did what I had to do, even if what I had to do was hurt someone that had come to mean a lot to me. I mean... What was she supposed to do? While I was in practice on the road playing games, I couldn't ask her to sit at Healy and wait for me to find time to talk to her or to sneak back to town to see her. Nah, it was better if I just let her go. I thought she'd get over it. She didn't. It only took about 15 minutes to cross the lake to the other side of town and arrive at the curl and die. Leslie was running brisk business. The lot outside her shop with its faded lines and weeds growing up through the cracks was dotted with cars. I could hear music and female voices and laughter wafting through the front doors, which were propped open with a box fan, circulating air. My mind immediately went to my shop, which was cooled by central air. I dipped my head to step inside, nodding at a few people who were waiting in chairs next to the front desk, reading magazines and sipping on bottles of water. Tamara and two other girls were at their stations, with customers in chairs. The air was full of the scent of hot curling irons and blow dryers. Leslie was washing hair at the worst makeshift shampoo bowl I had ever seen. It was functional, but the laundry sink cut down with a dip in one side was ugly as hell. I wasn't trying to down Leslie's shop. It was just so old school. From the photos of 90s hairstyles on the wall, to the low-rent air conditioning system, to the busted-down chairs and the dull cracked linoleum tiles, why she wanted to keep the place open was a puzzle to me. KC. Leslie called out, loudly to be heard over the music, the dryer and the spray of water. Come on back. She angled her head, gesturing me over to her. I walked through to the back of the small shop, feeling like a giant, until I made it to the shampoo bowl. Grab me a towel from around the counter over there. I turned, dipping my head around the corner to find a stack of folded towels. I grabbed one and handed it to her. She smiled her thanks and lifted the customer's head out of the bowl, and wrapped the towel around her sopping wet hair. When it was secure, she helped the woman stand, and then pointed toward her station. Have a seat at my chair. I'll be right there. The woman shuffled away, taking more than a few moments to reach Leslie's station. So, what brings you to this side of town? Leslie sprayed the remaining shampoo suds down the sink as she asked. And don't even try that in the neighborhood business. You are never in this neighborhood. Nah, I came over here on purpose this time. I wanted to know if you thought about what we talked about the other night. She pulled me around the corner, in front of the tall stack of towels. She pulled one off the top and began drying her hands. Yeah, I thought about it. Thought about it a lot. Okay. I straightened, standing with my feet apart and folded my arms across my torso. Are you coming to the meeting tomorrow? Are you bringing anyone with you? I'm coming to the meeting tomorrow. Tamara will be there, and I'll be bringing a few people, my dad and grandpa for starters, but it won't be to support you or the other side of town. Oh, 
My brow shot up in surprise. So what's the purpose of? The purpose would be to show the mayor that this side of town isn't dead yet. So stop trying to kill us by bringing in modern replacements. Quincy Adams is shady as hell and has been for a while. I think the city council is afraid of him. But if we can get any reaction on either side of our issue, it'll mean he'll be out of the picture, which will be good for my business and yours. But don't for a minute think we're marching over to that meeting tomorrow to support you. Far from it. Les, you okay back there? Tamara poked around the corner, sticking her nose in where it didn't belong. I'm fine, Tam. We're just talking about the meeting tomorrow. And how we're not going up there to beg Mayor Adams to give him some money? She gave me the up and down glare, pursing her lips into a scowl. Your face gonna get stuck like that, I told her. She sucked her teeth and uttered boy shut up before dipping her head back around the corner i chuckled hiding it behind a hand i like getting on her nerves i see that but please stop it because after you're gone i have to hear her bitching about you all day and i'm not in the mood i'm surprised you don't join in with her y'all been singing in the fuck casey kavanaugh chorus since college don't get it twisted i haven't spent all this time thinking about you if that's what you're getting at After you left Healy, life went on. Uh Uh-huh. Okay, well, I stepped back, putting some space between her and I. I sensed something stirring up, and I wasn't sure I wanted to deal with it quite yet. I appreciate that you want to approach the city council with me. Alongside you, with a completely different issue. Related, but not the same. Alongside me, then. So if things don't go the way you want them to... I raised my hands in a sign of surrender. I'm just trying to think about one step at a time right now. Let's see what happens tomorrow and go from there. Leslie shrugged, which made her off-the-shoulder blouse shift. One side fell lower than the other, showing off the strap to her tank top and her light brown skin. The ring in her nose, a small gold hoop, was new, but it fit her like she always had it. Like any respectable hairdresser, her locks were on point as was everything about her. I'd always thought she was the perfect match, a thick snack that was whip-smart and funny as hell. I realized, standing in her shop and trying hard to get along with her, that I'd missed her. Some nights I would lay up in a hotel room in some city, or on the bus with the team, or on an overnight flight wishing I could talk to her, wishing I'd taken the steps to turn us from best friends into something more, but I was... I don't know if scared was the word. I thought it would ruin everything, make things awkward between us if I leaned over and kissed her. She didn't make a move either, so I was paralyzed. This cutie from a campus sorority started hanging around and everything I wanted to do with Leslie, I did with her instead. I had few regrets in life, but that was one of them. Because when it came to actually being with Leslie, I wish I hadn't wasted so much time with that other girl could have been with Leslie the whole time. Anything else you need to talk about? I need to get back to my chair. She had dumped the towel she used in a basket next to the washer, then started emptying the basket into the machine. My gaze traveled to her small waist and generously round ass. When she turned around and realized what had my attention, she shot me a glare that wasn't as vicious as she thought it was. She adjusted the shirt to cover her skin again, then propped her hands on her hips which was intended to make her seem more hostile, but the pose perked her breast up perfectly. And I was having a reaction. Nah, just, I'll see you tomorrow at the meeting. I turned, rushing back through the shop, trying to make it out of there before parts of my body made it obvious that Leslie still had an effect on me. Chapter 15 Leslie How long you gonna be mad at me, Tamara? Until you wake up? She snapped, popping her gum and slamming hair care products around in the cabinet we use for extra stock. You mind not throwing my shit around while you have your temper tantrum? She huffed, then slammed the metal door shut. I have an appointment. I followed her to her chair, which she knew I would do. Tam was prone to getting hot under the collar. She and I needed to talk things out so she could get her attitude out and her mood in check. If I didn't force the conversation, there would be nothing but sniping and side commentary from her. She and I were too close for that. What are you mad about exactly? 
Do you even know? Halfway to her chair, Tam whirled around. Oh, I know exactly what I'm mad about. And I told your ass. I told you not to let some dust and cobwebs get you in trouble. That man is nice to you for 14 seconds, eat your mama's meatloaf sandwich, and all of a sudden you two are working together? Her espresso brown eyes rolled nearly all the way back in her head. She turned to walk to her chair, but stopped and whipped around to face me again. Do you remember after you let him hit and he ran off that you came crying to me? You sobbed on my shoulder. Now you're standing here telling me that you two are friendly and you're going to help him run for mayor? She turned again and this time made it to her chair, opened a drawer and pulled out a cape with a fading curl and dye logo. She laid it on the chair and pulled her apron from its hook on the wall, looping the top over her head and tying the strings behind her. Seriously, Leslie, are you out of your damn mind? I feel like you don't learn from past mistakes. Didn't I just rescue you from some other fool? Is this going to be my job from now on? Pulling you out of situations you should have never damn been in? Whoa, wait, hold on. What do you mean should have never been in? You knew KC was doing that sorority girl. You were jealous as hell and wouldn't admit it. You went to his room hoping to trump her like your pussy was sweeter. No, see, that's where you're wrong. They broke up long before I slept with KC. He was available, fair and square. She said they were still sleeping together, right up until he left Healy. And Dexter, she sighed, shaking her head. You wanted the opposite of KC, and you got him. And it still didn't work out, did it? I scratched my temple, trying hard to keep my temper in check. We needed to have this conversation. This conversation needed to stay a conversation and not turn into an argument. But Tamara was pushing buttons like only she knew how. So you're mad about some rumors from my college years and a relationship that went sideways through no fault of my own? What does that have to do with right now? And why are you cutting eyes at me and slamming shit around the shop? Because I'm sick of rescuing you from stupid leaps of faith, Leslie. I hope I'm wrong. But Casey fucked you and left you on the side of the road like the original groupie. I know you think you're different, but you're not. Not to guys like him. I'm not. And never was a Cade Kavanaugh groupie. Get that through your thick head of yours, first of all. Whatever, Leslie. You slept with him. He wasn't anything but a Healy University basketball player back then. I cared about him. We cared about each other. He had a funny way of showing it. Look, all I know is he'd better watch his step. Because if he so much as looks at you the wrong way, I'm going to go off. I had wandered over to my chair and much more calmly began to prep for Mrs. Isaac's appointment. She wouldn't be getting a color refresh, just a wash and roller set. At Tamara's threat, I stopped arranging things and turned around. This attitude is because you're protective of me. And you think Casey is going to fuck me over like he did in college, like Dexter did a few years ago. And you're going to be on the put Leslie back together team. Is that it? Tamara, folding towels at her station, didn't answer for a few seconds. But then, quietly, she said, I can't stand for you to be hurt again. Not when you can help it. There's no reason to invite heartache, Leslie. I moved a few feet away to her chair and pulled the towel she'd been folding out of her hands. I wrapped my arms around her shoulders and waited for her to relent and hug me back. I laughed when I finally felt her spinely arms around me, then shrieked when she poked her pointy nail talons in my side. I backed away, laughing. Tam was trying hard not to, but the corners of her mouth were creeping up. Go on now, making me all soft. Our apprentices have graduation stuff today, so we're down two people. It's going to be a busy day, and I actually have appointments, so I got shit to do. Fine, miss, I have shit to do. I love you, too. But if I don't do this and get Quincy Adams out of office, this place goes down in flames. And besides, I stopped to laugh, nervously playing with the small hoops in my ears. I'm helping him run for mayor, not screwing him. Mm-hmm, she hummed, stocking the freshly folded towels in the cabinet behind her chair. You forget that you wear your emotions. You are falling for him again. I don't even want to argue about it, Leslie. I've seen that look on your face before. Just be careful. Tamara, I promise, uh-uh. She protested, a hand up to block my words. 
I don't want to hear promises you know your dusty hard up ass can't keep. Do me a favor and get some dick or a vibrator or something to fight off those KC vibes because, girl, you are a sucker if I ever saw one. It was so lucky for Tam that Mrs. Isaacs walked in at that very minute because I was wearing some feelings on my face all right. <laughs>